welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end as we will hold a 30-minute networking session in the neural network. Here you can meet, ask questions to our distinguished speakers, connect, and chat with the AI for Good community. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. A very good day to everyone, and thank you very much for joining today's session. Welcome to the AI for Good Machine Learning 5G Challenge Webinar Session. My name is Thomas Pascal from ITU. Uh, the aim of the Machine Learning in 5G Challenge is to solve network-related problems using AI and machine learning. Today, we are excited to host another webinar. Uh, this is an explanation for one of the problem statements in the 2022 ITU AI and Machine Learning 5G Challenge Webinar, uh, sorry, problem statement. And the title of this problem statement is Depth Map Estimation in 6G Millimeter Wave Systems. As always, we are counting on you to help create an engaging discussion. Please make sure that you type your questions in the video wall and we'll take them during the Q&A. Now I'd like to introduce speakers for today's session. Uh, the webinar today is going to be presented or the talk is going to be given by Steve Blandino, Elena Senik, and Riot Karomi from National Institute of Standards and Technology in NIST in US. They are going to discuss depth map estimation in 6G millimeter wave systems, which is a problem statement for the 2022 challenge. In this challenge, uh, participants are invited to apply machine learning techniques using the NIST uh, Communication Technology Laboratory RF measurements to build a depth map, depth map of an environment. So in this webinar, you are going to learn how NIST is leveraging innovative measurements methods and equipment to shed light on millimeter wave propagation in your real world environment. And also at the end, we have some goodies lined up for you, some important announcements about the challenge. So please stay back until the end. Now I would like to welcome Steve, who is going to be the first speaker. Uh, good morning, Steve, and welcome to the webinar today. Hi, Thomas. Um... Okay, yeah, sorry, I had some technical problems. Hi, good morning. Hi, Thomas. Thanks for the introduction. I'll quickly share my screen. Um, I think you can see my screen, right? Yes, 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 please. OK. So thank you for the introduction. I'm pretty excited today to, to share uh, with you this talk. We are sharing a bit the vision that we have at least about the future. And it would be also nice to meet you all at the networking event after to a little bit, let's say, uh, brainstorm on what is going to be uh, 6G. Um, so the title of the talk is Depth Map Estimation um in a 60g millimeter wave uh, systems so while let's say um 6g vision is not clear yet and will grow in the coming years it is clear that 6g will uh, support let's say unprecedented variety of applications uh, that are actually uh that will be present in every aspect of our life. Um, so there are a number of application and vision, um, which will be enabled thanks to new technologies, uh, new bandwidth uh, of spectrum available. And this application will go well beyond uh, conventional uh, communication purposes that has been common, let's say, uh, from one to uh, 5G. 
um, it's going to be uh, a network with more capabilities and more uh, functionalities. Uh, think, for example, uh, the possibility to, um, let's say, uh, explore and understand uh, vital sign uh, of a person to detect, for, for example, um, heart rate or breathing uh, rate anomalies to detect health anomalies. Or think about the revolution uh, that can happen in the mobility sector um, thanks to the integration of communication, high speed communication and low latency communication with the sensing feature for uh, traffic monitor, uh, monitoring or target classification that can just enable um, uh, a wide uh, possibility of features, for example, autonom autonomous driving. And there are also application, uh, smart cities, smart home, uh, thanks to uh, sensing recognition of presence of people. We can adapt, uh, for example, the uh, environment temperature, temperature and, and so on. And smart industries is also a big, a big sector uh, where uh, integrating several features uh, can enable uh, communication, cooperative communication between uh, drones, uh, robots uh, to, to speed up, let's say, the uh, industrial process. Um, so already we see that 6G is not just about increasing of data rate, uh, latency and the energy efficiency, uh, it's going to be al always there. We always look for higher data rate, lower latency, better energy efficiency. Uh, but there are other uh, features that we are coming. So other, uh, let's say, KPI that we want to improve, uh, for example, sensing resolution. But it's not going to be just about KPI. It's really about uh, supporting new application. And it's going to be about, let's say, uh, being flexible of supporting uh, a variety, uh, um, um, a lot of diverse application. So we need a network that is uh, not just fast, uh, but is also flexible and that is supported by an intelligence that is able to, to adapt to every situation. So uh, AI and machine learning is going to be at the core. The network will be based, will be built on top of this intelligence. Um, and of course, uh, for how the AI and machine learning works, we, we, need, uh, we need data. Uh, we need to process data. We need to transmit data. Uh, but especially, we need to acquire uh, data. We need to acquire uh, a multi-dimensional uh, information um, that are well beyond the communication. So what uh, we have been doing so far uh, is usually to use sensors to, uh, for example, have an understanding of the uh, environment to, to get some information of the environment. So we used, we are using, uh, cameras, we are using radar, LiDAR, uh, smartphone drones, and whatever IoT uh, device uh, that, that are surrounding us. Uh, we are discussing now also the idea of uh, using integrated sensing and communication to acquire multidimensional information. So uh, use RF signals, use communication signals to understand the physics of the world and to see the world uh, just using RF signals. Um, so there are uh, some differences between uh, this, uh, let's say, methodology to acquire multidimensional information. Uh, in, in terms of the sensor network, uh, when we use LiDAR images, um, uh, we basically acquire directly the multidimensional data, the um, extra information. It's basically the, the feature of this device that we use. Um, when we use multiple sensors, what we are doing is to um, acquire multiple data by investing on extra hardware, 
and extra power consumption, and that might not be really scalable over large networks, this, despite giving us a very good understanding of the environment. Um, the other solution and another branch of research that is happening uh, right now is using the RS signals, um, reusing the same basically hardware and spectrum um, of communication to um, understand the surrounding and basically um, acquire a massive amount of data. Uh, while that's, that's good because we minimize the, um, the need of extra devices, we still have problems, of course, because we need some extra processing uh, to acquire uh, the multidimensional data that is already, that is instead uh, a native kind of dimension in the sensor network. Um, I'll spend a few words on uh, uh, Isaac network, just a bit of introduction. So it's a topic, it's a very uh, hot topic in, in this moment. The idea is to, uh, let's say, um, reuse the spectrum and the devices that we have already, uh, but also the protocol uh, with the idea to perform at the same time communication and sensing that will allow to, to scale the sensing to scale new features uh, by using uh, just a communication network. And in the end, uh, sensing, it's um, kind of uh, already uh, a feature of communication because uh, if you want to track, for example, a person moving, uh, the person moving is basically uh, modifying the interaction of the um, of the signal uh, and, and 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 the environment. So the the received signal will change over time. Uh, I have a small animation. Uh, here, for example, the person is moving and the received signal will uh, will see a, a variation over time. So by tracking those time variation of the wireless signal, we can use signal processing technique, uh, machine learning, AI to understand what is happening in the environment. Um, and we have done this already. Um, we have used communication ways to, to see the physical world. Uh, I have here an example uh, of the effect of human presence on uh, 60 gigahertz propagation. This is some measurements that we did a couple of years ago. So basically, uh, in, in this uh, case, we have a transmitter antenna array and a receiver antenna array at millimeter wave. And we see that uh, transmitting a, a, a wave, a wave, and uh, we see that the impact of the human presence on the received signal. And what we see is that basically uh, the, uh, the path loss is changing over time. And right before the human is blocked in the line of sight, we see a, a very particular pattern that is due, uh, is, uh, due to the interaction between the, the signal and, and the human. And this is uh, very interesting information uh, because we can understand that there is uh, a presence of, of the of the human that is blocking the uh, the propagation, and this is what uh, other people have done in the literature. Uh, uh, what they did it was to observe the the signal variation on a limited amount of time, and basically, if they see this uh, particular pattern uh, due to the interaction between the uh, body and the and the signal, they could predict the presence of someone blocking the um, uh, the signal. So this is a, a first example how communication wave can work. And um, this is another study that we uh, that we did last year. This is based on on simulation, and here we are really using uh, an two dot eleven AY protocol, so a real communication system, uh, and we consider. Um, to WLAN access point that they are communicating. Uh, so it's a simple communication that we have nowadays already in our homes. So the transmitter is uh, transmitting a signal, the receiver is receiving the signal, and there is just a person moving uh, inside the room. And thanks to the analysis of the communication pattern, the receive wave, uh, we are able to estimate uh, some 
uh, feature of the environment, in this case of the target. We can understand what is the velocity, what is the position. Uh, and we get actually a pretty um, uh, accurate, in this case, uh, estimation of the, of the target velocity. And that was simulation, but actually this works also in real life. We did also a measurement campaign on that. Um, and it's a pretty similar setup. We have a transmitter and a receiver to different, uh, let's say, uh, communications devices that are uh, separated over space. Uh, and we use millimeter wave uh, antenna rays. And the conclusion is uh, always the same. We just using communication signal, we are able to understand that there is someone in the room and, and we are able to understand its, its velocity and its position. Uh, but what we want to discuss uh, now is, let's say, what we can do more than that, uh, where we can go in the future. Uh, so can we use the communication ways not just to, to see and describe, uh, let's say, the environment, but to really create, uh, recreate uh, a digital world, to uh, create a virtual copy of, uh, of the world and use this digital copy that we have created, for example, just using uh, ISAC, just using uh, a REST and uh, with the aid of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, can we use it for uh, providing solution to the physical world? So uh, this is basically uh, what uh, recently has been referred as digital twin problem. Recreating the physical world in the digital domain and then use the digital domain to perform simulation, verification, prediction, or control. So ba basically, if you have a problem in the physical world, you can solve it in the digital world. And thanks to a simple inference, you can have the results in the physical world. Um, I have a simple example on this, and I'm using the beam selection at millimeter wave because I know that uh, it has been a very relevant topic in the uh, ITU in uh, ML in 5G challenge. Uh, so I think the audience may be familiar with that. Um, so the beam selection problem, um, it's about uh, trying to align the beam between transmitter and receiver. As you know, uh, at millimeter wave, we use large antenna rays um, and large antenna rays are actually uh, producing um, small beam. So if transmitter and receiver needs to communicate, their beams need to be synchronized. So in a traditional way, uh, what we have been done, it was basically to, to do a scan of the environment. So for example, one of the nodes was, was uh, changing its beam and transmitting a signal. And the other node was understanding which one of this beam was the, the best one. And basically spending a lot of time of doing this process, in both at the tra at transmitter and at the receiver. So that's the traditional way to, to solve the problem. Uh, in recent year, and actually uh, also at the moment, uh, we, are, uh, we have a smarter solution by using sensor network, uh, sensor network with the aid of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, so for example, here I'm showing a couple of examples that are coming um, from this challenge. This, is, uh, this was a challenge in 2020 in which participants were challenged to, to use uh, camera, um, uh, LIDAR uh, on top of the RF uh, to predict the beam pattern. And this year, actually, this, there is another challenge by, uh, by using a multimodal sensing um, a measurement data set with uh, uh, the aid of, let's say, other sensors, like, for example, radar, uh, GPS uh, data, and so on. Uh, what we are trying to do here is, is that to use just RF signals. Uh, the idea uh, will be to reproduce the physical world, make it digital, and thanks to the use of this digital uh, reconstruction of the environment, can we perform uh, this beam selection in the digital world without 
spending resources in the physical world and then just give a solution of the problem. So uh, that doesn't mean that we don't need sensor, um, sensor networks anymore. Actually, uh, those are still important. Uh, those are still uh, vital to the realization of such a vision. And what we are trying to do is to use sensor network just at the beginning of the process. So basically use the sensor network to, to design and train uh, the machine learning model. Uh, but then when it comes to the inference, when we want to use the model, we would like to use just RF signals. And uh, that's why um, at NIST we are still, uh, we, we are actively collecting um, measurements, not just in RF, but also in other domain. And Yelena will uh, explain a little bit what we are doing uh, at NIST at the moment. Thank you, Steve. So first we will show measurement environment. So we collected data in uh, inside the conference room uh, with our channel sounder system. So on the picture on the left, you can see uh, the typical setup in the conference room with chairs and tables. And then uh, on the uh, in this inside the left uh, white box, you can see our transmitter section. And transmitter was fixed in the corner of the room during measurements. Uh, height of the transmitter uh, was 2.5 meters and transmitter should simulate like access point. And then um, in box on the right, you can see our receiver mounted on the robot and receiver was moving uh, across the room. Um, we'll take a closer look on the receiver on the next slide. But now we can see that height of the antenna rays was 1.6 meters, and that's typical height of the uh, people. So it should simulate someone walking and talking on the cell phone. And then on the right side, you can see the map of the environment. And uh, this is the map that robot would make. So before we do real measurements, we come to the environment and map the area. So the robot has laser range finder. So next time we do come to do real measurements, uh, then we can uh, use this map and send robots in different positions in the room. So on the map in the bottom left corner, you can see um, transmitter and then uh, receiver was uh, moving in these three areas marked as uh, area one blue, area two purple and area three green. So we will send to different points in these uh, areas and a receiver would collect the data. Uh, so Steve and Ray will later talk more about this, but the idea is that we will provide data from one area that you can train the model and then uh, test it on another area. So next slide, please. Okay, this is closer look on our receiver. So on the left image, you can see our whole receiver on the bottom. Uh, this red box represents our uh, robot that would enable us to do me mobile measurements. And then other equipment that supports mobile measurements like power supply and very important timing section uh, that we don't need synchronization cable between transmitter and receiver to do RF measurements. But what we are interested here to see is the top part of the receiver and that one you can see closer look on this middle picture. And first, we have antenna array. And um, as Steve mentioned, we are providing the RF data. So we collect RF data using these 16 horn antennas. And one example of our RF data, you can see in the uh, bottom right corner. So after we process uh, the RF data, we are uh, getting what we call multipath components or arrivals, and we have information for each arrival, information about delay, path gain, and also um, angle of departure and angle of arrival in azimuth and elevation. Then on top of the receiver of the RF array, we have 360 degrees LiDAR. And on the right side, you can see a 3D depth mapped produced by LiDAR. And then on top of that 360 degrees camera that would provide us with the 360 degrees 
images with very high resolution, seven frames per second. Uh, so while in motion, receiver collects RF data, 360 LiDAR data, and 360 photos of the environment. <clears throat> and what's uh, what was very important is to synchronize the, uh, these three systems. So uh, the data that uh, we provide here will be like map one to one, meaning that at one uh, receiver is moving, but at one specific receiver position, we provide RF data and the lighter frame that was collected in the same moment, and also the camera image that was collected at the, at the same time. Uh, and on the later slide, we'll see the data format for all three systems. Here you can see where the data are really coming from. I think that would be all. Still back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Yelena. So now we can... Uh, go into the detail of the challenge. So to enable the vision that we uh, discussed in the introduction, uh, using our measurement data, we, we would like to, to, to have an estimation of the depth map of, of a room using uh, millimeter wave signals and uh, machine learning algorithms. So uh, we consider indeed a transmitter and a receiver, which are MIMO nodes. Uh, and indeed one uh, node is fixed if the transmitter one uh, node is moving, uh, that is the receiver. And the uh, receiver is actually moving in terms of position, but is also changing orientation. So, um, the data that you uh, that we are providing and that are actually collected are dependent on the position and the orientation. So every time uh, the room is like estimated from the lidar, is gonna have a relative uh, position. It is gonna be relative to the position and the orientation of the receiver. So uh, uh, at each position, the uh, room will be. Uh, like different. Uh, so the, the, the challenge is to estimate the depth map of the environment at uh, each receiver position uh, using uh, millimeter wave uh, signals. And um, going into the detail of, uh, let's say, uh, of the challenge, the um, uh, nodes are uh, using my mountain arrays. Um, so after the collection of the channel impulse response uh, that uh, Elena just shown, uh, what we do is to create a MIMO matrix. So we uh, resemble the multipod component that we collected uh, at uh, 1.76 gigahertz. That is the rate, uh, the common rate of um, 2.11 AD and the Y. And we build uh, MIMO matrix, uh, assuming that we have 64 antenna transmitting and 64 uh, uh, receive antenna uh, using a panel of uh, eight by eight, basically. And, and so each uh, entry of this MIMO matrix, so for example, from this antenna to, uh, to the other receiver antenna, uh, is it, gonna look like this. It's a channel impulse response. Um, uh, sampled at a fixed rate, um, and, and you basically see all the all the multipath components that they are uh, clearly uh, visible. And of course, the the use of uh, MIMO and multiple antennas will help in uh, in, in giving some let's say uh, information about the special domain about the angular uh, about the angular AOA and AOD in azimuth uh, and uh, and elevation so um, this is uh, the overview of the challenge uh, we expect uh, the design of a machine learning and, uh, model that takes as an input uh, MIMO channel, uh, channel and will give as an output the depth map of the environment. Uh, 
So uh, for um, for training or in general for understanding what is the depth map, the real depth map of the environment, so the ground truth, we will use LIDAR data. So we'll provide uh, MIMO channel as, a, as the input of the algorithm and we expect a point cloud uh, as an output that can be compared to the uh, LIDAR uh, measurement. So uh, if we, uh, look at the process of, um, of let's say the design of the model, uh, we would expect that uh, at the beginning, we can uh, design a model by uh, training uh, the model with a, um, a data set that is composed by a, a LiDAR data set that we are providing and the RF data set that we are providing. And this is going to be collected in one of the areas that uh, has been shown. Uh, when we want to, to test and evaluate the model, uh, we would like to, to make, um, let's say, we would like to have an algorithm that is uh, general, that works also in other areas of the room. So uh, in uh, using the same room, but going through data that the uh, machine learning algorithm didn't see before. So uh, the evaluation data set is collected in another uh, part of the, of the room. And, and the model uh, will, will be, let's say, will give uh, an output uh, that is the ladder uh, point cloud, just um, basically uh, having as input the, R, uh, the RF data and then the evaluation uh, of the model is, is, uh, is pretty simple because it's just a comparison between the uh, estimated point cloud and the real uh, point cloud uh, that is given from measurements so the evaluation metric that we use is the uh, chamfer distance it's uh, basically has been used uh, to to measure uh, the differences between uh, point uh, point cloud. Uh, so for example, it's, it's basically a, a, a sum of two distances. If we have uh, two point clouds that we want to compare, for example, um, the green and the yellow, uh, if we want to, uh, to measure the distance between uh, the the green and the yellow, what we need to do first is to solve a matching problem that is, uh, what is the closest point, uh, the closest yellow point to the green. Um, so what we will do is to do, in this case, a, a minimum, uh, I'll do a, a search over um, each green point and find what is the closest yellow point. And after we find all those distances, we just sum over those distances. And the other way around, uh, we we will sum, uh, basically, uh, computing the distance, um, com computing the closest point to uh, from the yellow uh, point cloud to the to the green. So uh, we will uh, consider um, the yellow point cloud find the closest green point, and uh, and sum over all those distances. So in the end, uh, the ranking is gonna uh, be based on the average over all the points um, that, uh, that we will test. So um, yeah, the ranking is based on the average of the chamfer distance over the different position. And uh, as a price, uh, we have the opportunity uh, for uh, a guest researcher position, uh, at least. So this is the description uh, of the challenge. We will go now with uh, Raid a bit into the details of the of the data. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, as Steve and Elena explained, uh, uh, the uh, challenge and the data set and how the data set was collected. Now I will go first uh, through uh, how to get the data set and what is the format of the data set. 
So first, uh, you can see here in this slide, uh, uh, that's uh, the data set uh, title and also uh, a link to NIST website where you can get uh, the data set. So currently, uh, we have area one. And later on, we will provide uh, a data set for different areas for testing and evaluation. Um, so uh, for the data set, you can find see uh, three folders, uh, camera, LIDAR, and RF. Um, I want just to explain that uh, the camera is not needed for the main challenge, but I will uh, uh, soon explain. Um, we have a bonus problem that we will use the images, uh, but for the main challenge, you will just need the LIDAR and uh, the RF uh, for, for training. So this will be a training data set, and later on, we will provide other uh, 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 data sets for, for testing, likely with LiDAR only. Um, other thing that you need uh, to be aware of is uh, we also have a GitHub link here uh, that we um, uh, uh, put the code for, for example, the evaluation script and the method that uh, Steve described. And also, at the moment, you can uh, go to the website, download the data set. But I think if you want to download the, all the files of the data set, it might be challenging to download it um, this way. You can still download samples of the files. But soon, we will have uh, a script that automates the download of the data set. We will we'll put it here in, in this link. Um, for the data itself, so. Um, as also Elena mentioned, it's one-to-one -one mapping. So for each camera uh, or for each RF uh, file, we have a LiDAR file, we have a camera file, and they are all synchronized. And this is the format here at the bottom for uh, indexing the files of, of different data types, uh, depending on the cases of, of, uh, of each area. Uh, so uh, next slide. OK, so the first data, data type is the uh, RF data, uh, which is basically uh, uh, my emotional impulse response uh, with uh, uh, .mat file. And you can see here uh, an example of the antenna arrays. Uh, and on the, uh, on the uh, bottom uh, right side, you can see the structure, which is uh, Rx antennas uh, times the uh, Tx antennas and uh, delay taps, which, as also Steve explained, was sampled at uh, 1.7 uh, uh, 6 gigahertz uh, sampling rate. Uh, so it's basically just the uh, .NET file, so it's very easy to to read and uh, and and uh, process. Next slide. And. For LiDAR, uh, so basically the LiDAR is Auster uh, OS0128, uh, but we um, downsampled the data to make it uh, easier to deal with, uh, especially for, for the type of the challenge. Uh, it's uh, point cloud data PCD format, uh, binary uh, files uh, with uh, uh, floating 32-bit uh, 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 data type. Uh, you can see here an example of what, what it looks like. Um, it only includes the location, uh, the point cloud location of, of the data. Here is also a demonstration uh, on the bottom left uh, for the LiDAR data uh, uh, with a scatter plot. Uh, it's easy uh, to um, read and deal with the data because it's, it's a standard PCD uh, data. So you can read it with MATLAB. Uh, we, you will need uh, toolbox. I think it's a uh, uh, computer vision toolbox. But for open source, it's also very standard. You can read it with Python. Uh, this is uh, Open3D, a very good um, uh, uh, library to read and process point cloud data. And another uh, uh, library I show also here. Uh, next slide. Next slide, uh, please. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So the images 
here are 360 with a queer rectangular projection. As I mentioned, these are not needed for the main challenge. You will only need them for what I will describe um, in the coming uh, slides if you want to take the bonus challenge, but this will not be related to the main challenge. So basically we have um, high resolution uh, images, 360 of the uh, uh, room here, and it's uh, with uh, a query triangular projection. Uh, so well, you can convert it to cube map projection uh, if you want to process it for machine learning and computer vision related uh, machine learning algorithm, and then you can stitch it back uh, and stitch the results also. Uh, next slide. So this is the bonus problem. As I mentioned, this is a kind of separate problem. Uh, uh, we added this uh, bonus problem because we already are uh, putting the data uh, data set there. And it's also an important uh, problem that uh, I will explain uh, why, why it's important to us. So I think by now you have uh, seen that our measurement system is uh, context aware, um, meaning it collects realization of the environment with every RF data set uh, or every RF data collection. We use the data, uh, this data, for accurate millimeter wave channel model, which is uh, important to accelerate the uh, deployment of next G uh, wireless systems. Uh, for example, in the figure, you can see a demonstration of the multipath components of the signal reflecting from uh, different objects. Uh, so we need to accurately resolve these multipath components in the 3D space, uh, meaning we need to know which uh, object they are coming from in order to have accurate channel uh, models for millimeter wave. And this is only viable if we can automate the processing of large uh, volumes of data, which our measurement system is capable of collecting. It collects uh, a lot of data. We need to uh, automate and process this data by utilizing machine learning techniques to process uh, the data and uh, perform different tasks uh, uh, while um, doing channel modeling. Uh, we still use uh, some classical approach for channel modeling, but we utilize machine learning for uh, uh, parsing the environment uh, on, on the on 3D space. So basically we need to know the uh, what objects are in the 3D space and where they are in the 3D space. As I mentioned, is this is computer vision problem, but it's very important for uh, channel millimeter wave channel model that we are doing. Uh, so uh, first, we want to uh, parse the environment, recognize uh, uh, and segment the object, and also if we can uh, generate a 3D model of the environment. Uh, and automate this process. Uh, this will uh, enable us to automate the mapping of these multipath components and um, eventually predict uh, channel models for the new and different environments from these three uh, 3D uh, models for the area where no RF was collected. So. We go through all these steps to uh, have a accurate channel modeling uh, for millimeter wave. So, in this in this bonus problem, the main objective is to model the 3D uh, 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 space or 3D environment and recognize all these objects. Uh, it's a little bit. Um, a convoluted problem because there are different steps to go through and 
uh, that's uh, why uh, we put it here first because it's computer vision also we put it here as a bonus problem but it's also as i mentioned it's very important for for this channel model uh, type uh, next slide so there are three sets of sub problems to uh, to achieve the 3d modeling you don't necessarily need to solve all of them to do the channel modeling but ideally if we have accurate 3d model of the environment uh, and uh, the process is automated this will be the ideal case but generally you don't necessarily need to have the final step uh, that's why we kind of want to evaluate it based on different sub problems uh, so the first um, sub problem there are obvious is the object recognition on in the um, environment uh, also possibly semantic segmentation uh, and maybe a better option would be uh, pan optic segmentation which is a combination of instance segmentation and semantic segmentation because sometimes you don't only want to know where is um, uh, what what object is segmented but uh, if there are more than one object you need to know which object is which uh, uh, for for uh, the uh, in the environment uh, the next sub problem sets of sub problems is the point cloud semantic segmentation so now you can use the lidar uh, data to do uh, semantic segmentation. Um, also, uh, probably you need to do uh, depth map estimation and uh, another uh, possibility is to do simultaneous localization and mapping for, for the LiDAR. And finally, to get to the 3D model, you uh, want to do a sensor fusion between the camera and LiDAR and then to reach to, to the final step, which is 3D modeling of the environment. Uh, there, this problem is not new. I, I would guess, I would say, probably decades old problem. And I, I've shown here an example. Uh, there are maybe some solutions. Uh, most of the time, these solutions are tied to specific hardware. And um, uh, what I want to say is, kind of the open source solutions for this is a little bit limited, especially if you don't tie uh, this to specific uh, uh, hardware type. Uh, so these are the three sets of sub problems. And if you can get the final step, uh, that's um, good. But we can also, we will also put, give uh, points to to different sub problems uh, uh, on, on, on this um, whole uh, 3D modeling uh, problem. Uh, next slide. So again, I, I want to emphasize this uh, uh, will not affect, uh, if you take this uh, additional challenge, will not affect the main challenge. This is separate. Uh, we wanted to motivate people to solve also this problem because we have the data set and is also the, the problem is very important uh, for millimeter wave channel modeling and the type of system that we are using. Uh, but basically, we will evaluate it uh, uh, based on uh, qualitative points. So it's uh, uh, the, we will say we will have 30 points total for the problem uh, for the solution. If you have the ideal solution. Of course, you need to be very accurate, automated. For example, if you can generate, I showed here one example of what type of solution would be ideal, but it's this is not necessarily the only uh, example of type of files like uh, wave for wave front object and material template, but it could be any uh, type that provide these details of the 3D model and the uh, 
object or the material of the object where it's in the environment. Uh, but if you don't have the ideal solution, we will evaluate also based on the sub problems. So as I mentioned, you need to solve multiple type of problems here. So I, I show here the table will evaluate based on like uh, image based machine learning algorithms will have from zero to 15 points. Uh, point cloud algorithms will have uh, zero to 10 and sensor fusion of 3D modeling zero to five and so on, the total is 30 points. But if you can get an ideal solution without going through one of these steps, that's fine. We probably will give you 30 points. So that's the way we are thinking of the evaluation of this problem. And uh, hopefully I motivated you well to take the, the bonus challenge. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so this is a separate uh, uh, prize. Again, it's opportunities for a guest researcher position at NIST. And as I mentioned, the ranking will be point-based qualitative uh, ranking. Uh, again, uh, it will not affect the main challenge, uh, the separate problem. Uh, that's all I have for uh, the bonus problem. Uh, back to you, Steve. Thank you. So I will just wrap up and um, uh, just discuss about, uh, let's say, uh, summarize what we have been discussing today. So what we want to, to do, what we have seen today is that uh, future network will support an unprecedented variety of uh, application will be everywhere, will be pervading every aspect of human life. So uh, the main problem is scaling the network. So data acquisition and processing uh, is one of the biggest challenges to overcome if we consider, uh, low, uh, if we want to keep low cost and power consumption. So ideally to create a sustainable network uh, we need to explore, exploit as much as possible the resources and the hardware that we already have. And so we are challenging uh, the participants to, to contribute to this vision of a, a sustainable scalable, scalable network. Uh, so what we want to do is to leverage RF signals to estimate the depth map of an environment. This will uh, contribute somehow to, to the realization of, of the digital world. And uh, also reconstructing the environment uh, in the bonus challenge, uh, utilizing LiDAR and images will, uh, will help to, to go towards that uh, direction of creating a sustainable digital world. And as last slide, I just wanted to, to thank you all the team um, that has supported this project, and I am open to questions. Uh, thank you so much, Steve and, and colleagues, for introducing the problem statement as well as the bonus uh, part. This is quite exciting how we can reconstruct the digital world using uh, RF. So right now it's time to go into the Q&A, and I would like to request my colleague Vishnu. Uh, hi, Vishnu. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, once again, excellent problem statement. Uh, and uh, I was looking at my notes. Uh, it was exactly one year back. I think we had the previous challenge uh, uh, <laughs> webinar with, uh, I remember, with uh, Tangi, you, and uh, uh, Raid, and the colleagues. Thank you very much again. Uh, first question, on the frequency that you're using, are you, are you still using 60 gigahertz or some other frequency band uh, for the data that you're collecting? And uh, yes. whether, the, whether the line of sight matters? Because uh, Yelena, while she was explaining, I was looking at the photos and uh, 
I was wondering if the line of sight matters or what. So could you please explain it a little bit about the frequency and the, 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 the characteristics of the frequency actually? Yeah, Elena, do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. So measurements were collected uh, at uh, 60.5 gigahertz uh, frequency and uh, regarding uh, environment and line of sight conditions, yes, um, I didn't emphasize, but all the time since transmitter was in the corner of the room and receiver was moving uh, in different areas of the room, uh, we maintain line of sight conditions all the time to make things very simple and straightforward. Uh, so people that would conduct measurements would be in the corners of the room. So um, definitely we had line of sight all the time and frequency again is 60 gigahertz. Thank you for that mm -hmm. question. Thank you very much. And one, one, more, one more question, follow up maybe. The noisy data, do you have, do you have such data which has noise in it or these are filtered uh, from it or do you do you have noise in the in the data the participants what what can they expect from in, in the data uh, are they seeing clean data or is it uh, you have you have noisy data in the data set so the the data so that the measurements uh, are uh, filtered and so we have uh, pretty high accurate um data set and uh, we haven't added the, any artificial noise so the the measurements are clean uh, the, yeah the data set uh, um, is clean yeah okay but but uh just to clarify steve so you you have been the really um, it, it's it's collected as it is isn't it i mean you you have not removed any noise also right or or you, you have uh, no uh, well uh, the thing is that the mm -hmm. the dynamic range of our system is uh, is quite large so the noise floor is is pretty low so of course there is some noise that it cannot be removed but it's i wouldn't say ideal but it's uh, uh, let's say it's uh, it's a very good dynamic range, so it's, uh, noise shouldn't be a problem. I think um, the technical problem of the challenge is not lim limited by the noise. Yeah. For of example, course. if you look at a power delay profile of the signal, so we would say, for example, that a difference between peak of the signal, first arrival, and the noise is around 60 dB, so that's the dynamic range that you can expect. Okay. It's yeah, in the, well above the traditional operating SNR of a network. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, some participants are interested in knowing how many prices are there. So, so, so yeah, it's, so <laughs> it's basically two one for the main challenge, let's say, and one for the bonus problem. Okay, okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, so so it's just for the topper, right? The, the top, topmost of each one, right? That, that's exactly. right. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for that clarification. And um, uh, let me ask this about uh, training times and uh, GPUs. So we always get this question that uh, in your experiments, uh, what kind of training times did you see? Because this is this is something which we the participant has to worry about. Uh, of course, uh, actually, Thomas has an announcement for those of who would like GPUs to train. Please hang on. Thomas has an announcement at the end. But let me ask. Uh, let me ask this to the colleagues from NIST. In your in your training. How much is the training time did you see, and did you use GPUs or any other uh, any other uh, constrained uh, resources that the participant should know about? Uh, right, I think you can take this question. Okay, uh, so for this problem, we haven't uh, solved the, this exact problem, but we solved similar problems, even some utilizing this data. So I think generally 
GPUs. So let, let me separate it a little bit. So for the main challenge, uh, you have LiDAR data and um, uh, the RF data. Uh, uh, looking at the size of the data, um, I would say even if you don't have like uh, very capable GPU, I think you should be fine probably even with CPU. That's why we reduce the sampling rate uh, also for, for uh, uh, the LiDAR. Uh, uh, basically, it, it, uh, it's also because the RF data will not be able to capture all uh, the environment. And at the same time, it will simplify uh, how you um, train uh, the data, uh, train the, your algorithm. So I, I, I can't say for sure, but I think you, you might be able to do even with CPU, but preferably at least some uh, GP for the main channel. For, for, okay. the, for the BANAS, I think GPU is preferable if you are using uh, uh, the images. Uh, we, we are doing uh, uh, an optic segmentation, semantic segmentation. Again, you can do with uh, CPU, but it will be very slow. So uh, uh, any GPU uh, that is uh, well, capable, uh, I would say average, maybe is fine. But for us, we use uh, multiple, actually multiple GPU, capable GPUs to parallelize even not only on the GPU, but uh, multiple GPUs. Uh, but yeah, I think it depends on what, what type of algorithm you are utilizing and what type of problem you are solving. Thank you very much, Right. Uh, by the way, by the way, I, I think the participants who need GPUs to solve the problem should hang, hang on. Just a moment, I want to say that. But, um, but uh, right about, um, about uh, the ML platforms that, uh, that you want the participant to use, is there anything particular that you want to use or is it uh, up to the participant? It, it is up to the participant. We, we want to, because the type of the nature of the problem, we want it to be uh, kind of open uh, ended. I always say for the image based, um, there are very good uh, uh, libraries. Uh, I think some of them use Python, or maybe uh, most of them I now use PyTorch, but there are some also use uh, TensorFlow. Uh, I, I think uh, one of them could be we used uh, Detectron 2, I think it's from Facebook AI. And another one is uh, Open MM Lab. Uh, uh, they have collection of uh, image-based uh, uh, computer vision type of algorithms. There are other open source also for uh, 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 point cloud type of data. But we, we don't have any restriction. You can use either those or even MATLAB or whatever you feel comfortable uh, solving the problem. Thank you. And um... Can I solve the bonus problem alone? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So, so you can can can, yeah. can someone solve? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Okay. Thank you very much. Um. Right. Uh, evaluation. So winning. Right. Everybody wants your prize. <laughs> so uh, plus ITU has its own prizes also. By the way. So I think uh, winning is important. Uh, uh, the evaluation. Could you talk a little bit about how you are evaluating the submission? So, what should what should we submit uh, from the participant side? I'm asking. What should the participants submit, and how are you evaluating those submissions? Okay. So, okay, first for the main challenge, I think the evaluation uh, will be uh, very uh, well defined. Uh, we have uh, chamfer distance evalu uh, 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 computation, and then we will average over uh, this. The data, uh, your algorithm will not want to see, uh, so you are not trained on that data. And uh, then we will score uh, whoever gets the higher 
score. Of course, we will look. I mean, of course, we you need to submit the code. You need to submit the models. It's not like just you, you come up with it. Uh, and we will look at the code. But basically, we will rank on that uh, who will get the higher uh, 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 score. For the main challenge, uh, sorry, for the uh, for the bonus challenge. Uh, so okay, so let, let me just repeat. So so you need to submit your uh, uh, prediction data and uh, the modeling, prediction and the modeling, and then we will we will we will, we will look at it and, and evaluate the score. For the uh, uh, bonus problem. Uh, it's kind of open-ended uh, type of problem. Uh, that's why uh, well, we are saying it's qualitative evaluation based on points. We look at best, best solution in terms of quality, uh, in terms of ease of implementation, or, or like, uh, okay, so someone would take, okay, well, I can take this data and do modeling with some program, but that's not that's not what we want. We want to automate generation of this 3D map. So it, it, it will be kind of, we need to get the solution, whether it's, if it's not, if you don't submit the 3D model, uh, that's fine. We will evaluate based on uh, uh, these sub problems, like what is, what algorithm you used, what was the score, for example, for image-based uh, 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 algorithms, uh, whether it's semantic segmentation, preferably we would prefer pan-optic segmentation actually, because we want also to know instances of the object on the environment. And same for point cloud. So we look at these, we look at your output, what algorithm, how you improve, like fused state-of-the-art algorithm, how you improved over the, because we can use state-of-the-art algorithm. There are pretty much like a lot of uh, platforms that you can use for image but how you uh, define your problem, how you improve. So we look all, all into all these. Uh, again, it, eventually it will be qualitative. Hopefully we get a good solution that, uh, I, mean, I mean, if we see like two solutions, we, 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 can, we can also uh, try to make sure like which one give us, um, let's say, uh, quality and performance because also you need to be able to process the data. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's a little bit open-ended, but I, I hope that, that this doesn't uh, make people hesitant to submit the solution. Just feel free to submit the solution. We can, we can communicate with you. Thank you very much. Very interesting problem sets. And thank you for uh for patiently answering all the questions. I don't have any more questions, but I think uh, I, I really like your structure of the problem statements uh, with, the, with the main challenge and the bonus uh, problem. It's quite interesting to solve and there are, uh, there are uh, good resources that uh, Thomas will talk about in a bit. I also, uh, I also think that uh, uh, this is a very, very challenging problem statement, which is uh, there are there are actually participants here who are winners of uh, previous year. So I think they are listening. I hope they are listening. It's quite an interesting problem statement. Once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues, Steve uh, and uh, Raid and Yelena. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, back to you, Thomas. Thanks a lot, Vishnu, uh, for the Q&A, for having that kind of uh, interesting discussion. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to make some few announcements. Uh, first and foremost, we would like to announce that the challenge is open. And I've shared in the video uh, the link where you can participate, register, check out this problem statement, and register as well as participate in the problem statement. We will update with the links of the GitHub where you can download the data set, but uh, also the link is, is available in the video wall, so please check, uh, check it out. Another announcement is that we have, as already Vishnu pointed out, we have a uh, compute platform, the ITU uh, challenge compute platform, where you can use our ITU uh, challenge servers uh, for the usage of the challenge. 
in this case, you can contact us and we will give you access to our GPUs free of charge only for the usage of the challenge. So if you're participating in one of the problem segments in, the, in this edition of the challenge, please give, a, give us a shout out and we'll give you access to the servers. Uh, this is the end of the announcements and I'd like to thank Steve, uh, Helena and Wright for making some time to be with us to explain the problem statement as well as the bonus part. Uh, thank you so much. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining the session. Uh, we are going to be in the neural network for networking. So please stay around and let's chat there. We have more sessions. Please go direct to the AI for Good program and you find many sessions that we have planned in future. For today, I would like to give thanks a lot uh, to everyone for joining. Have a good day. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.